Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. This session, again, guns. So I thought we'd take a closer look at guns and women in Colorado and around the nation. From Coloradans for Civil Liberties, Laura Carno, you've been here many times before. Yeah, thanks for having me back. And Kimberly Corbin, thank you for joining us. You are an international sensation for asking <laughs> the president some very uncomfortable questions at, uh, what was that, a town hall meeting just a couple weeks ago. It was. Uh, now, CNN invited you to go do this. Yeah, they did. Um, gave me a call on the day of the president's press conference, and I was on a plane to D.C. the following day. I, I could see the wheels in his mind spinning so quickly to try to talk to somebody who's been through what you've been through and not sound completely callous. I don't think he succeeded. Um, Based on the feedback that I've gotten, uh, it sounds a lot like he did what we Coloradans are familiar with uh, now as a calling a hudak moment. A hudak moment, yes. which was yeah. to basically look in the eyes of a rape survivor and say, you know, it would have been worse if you were able to defend yourself with a gun. Right, because he understood better than I did having that experience what I should have done and what could have happened based on those statistics that he's got in front of him. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that, but let's, let's talk about, I don't think we ne need to remind everybody what happened here in Colorado a couple years ago when the legislature went hog wild and Bloomberg passed some ridiculous laws, including a magazine ban, which turns out to be over 15 rounds, and also an unworkable universal background system check. Most people like the idea of universal background checks. The system here, though, is, is just unworkable. When Massachusetts has a better system than Colorado, you know there's a problem. But what brought you into this? You, we worked together during that fight, and you became a very unique spokesman for, for a different angle. What brought you in? Right. So I, I worked in the world of politics, did some political media. When the gun bills came into effect on, um, in 2013, when they were first introduced, I paid a lot of attention to them. I am a decades-long gun owner. My firearm has sat in my nightstand, minding its own business for decades. And I was kind of ticked off that the, the, the gun I have in my nightstand, if I were to buy it today, I wouldn't be able to buy it. It's more than 15 rounds, and it's just not right. So I scrounged together some money and started running ads against the ads that Bloomberg was running. He was running radio ads all around the state saying, um, call your legislators and tell them that we need this common sense gun control. I ran ads saying, don't you dare tell me how to defend myself, not thinking that it was going to change the, the argument or change the debate, but it made it a women's issue. I didn't try that, I just happened to be a woman saying, don't you dare tell me how to defend myself. One of the most amazing things that happened during that time was how the narratives changed. That there, there, there are a couple narratives that gun controllers just love. One is that law enforcement loves gun control. However, every single elected sheriff in the state signed a position paper against these gun control laws, and many of them went on to sue the state against them. That, that broke that narrative. But what you were able to do was to say, this, this, this is about women, too. And the idea that women love gun control, that myth was broken. Yeah, absolutely. And when we talked to people during the, so we had the, the gun control bills that passed, and then we had the recalls later in the year where Senator Morse and Senator Harone were both recalled. Later on, Senator Hudak uh, resigned uh, instead of being recalled. Um, but talking about this as a women's issue, and I don't like gender politics, so it feels funny for me to say that, but for a woman to say, it's my choice, my body, my gun, my choice, to a group of people who on the other side of the aisle say that they're pro-choice. Um, it's, it's just using that same language to help people understand who's to tell me how many bullets it takes to defend me against a rape. It's not that guy's job over there, it's my job. It was interesting that that was Salazar, a state representative, who said women don't need guns on campus. They, that's why we have rape whistles and call boxes. And then Evie Hudak's completely insensitive remarks to you. and I feel very uncomfortable about asking you about this, but your story is so compelling and um, that, that I think people need to hear it because people look at you and go, hey, that's not a real thing. And guys like Salazar will say, you just needed a rape whistle. And Evie Hudak will say, well, what you went through um, would have been worse off. Can, as, as comfortable as, as you feel, could you 
Could you tell me the story? Absolutely. Um, I grew up in Greeley, and when I was 20 years old, I had just moved off campus to some um, college area apartments, and on the early morning hours of May 12, 2006, a stranger broke into my apartment through a living room window, held me in my bedroom for two hours, and proceeded to sexually assault me. I was taken by surprise, um, had woken up feeling like I couldn't breathe, and had to lay there. Uh, just having turned 20 thinking, what was the last thing I said to my parents, to my brother? This is how I'm going to die. And I started thinking that, you know, I'm gonna have to take a different tact because I'm not able to defend myself right now. And so I started cataloging every single thing that he was saying. I started asking him questions, um, basically convinced him that I wasn't going to report, that everybody made mistakes, and I understood what he was doing. And from there, uh, he did actually leave my apartment and I was able to reach my cell phone that had been sitting on my bookcase headboard the entire time. Immediately called 911, but because of the poor cell phone service, my call dropped six different times and the response time, unfortunately, was 16 minutes and he was long gone before then. Um, it was at no fault of the police department. They did an outstanding job once they found our address because I was confusing where I was at with my old address. Um, and from there, the, the case entered the criminal justice system. So we had three weeks that went by, going through interviews, backwards, forwards, trying to recall all kinds of things to figure out who this was before an arrest was made. Um, he was at another uh, apartment complex picking out his next victim. And so the Weld County District Attorney's Office actually prosecuted the case um, beginning to finish, it was 16 months, but he was successfully convicted and put away for 24 years to life and is ser currently serving that in the Department of Corrections here in Colorado. So as I'm going along, I'm thinking, okay, why did this have to happen to me? Because immediately, within a month, I'm diagnosed with PTSD, with depression, I'm having panic attacks, I'm going through all of these things that I never experienced prior to this assault as a direct result of the rape. And so I started thinking, well, if I release my name to the media because there's been so much press on this man and you know, his face and what he did and nothing. We're completely leaving out the victim side that if I could release my name and tell my story that I didn't care if people remembered my face and I didn't care if they remembered my name. I just wanted them to learn from what happened to me. So I released my name to the media and started giving presentations and basically trainings to different advocates and law enforcement agencies on what we did right and what we did wrong. And from there, it just kind of took off and has helped quite a few survivors since then. Um, I didn't get involved in anything that had to do with gun legislation until actually I heard um, one of Laura's ads and I'm sitting on my couch at home and I'm currently a master's student thinking, well, I choose to defend myself on my campus and my gun's never had an issue and nobody knows that I carry concealed because you know, it's, it's concealed. And there is something very, very poignant in my mind that I am trying to protect myself from. And so when those legislation, um, those bills came up, Salazar had his comments, that was it. That got me off my couch and down in front of the senators to say, this is exactly what happened to me. And this is why I need this weapon. And this is why you don't know what's best for me. When Evie Huda looked at you, and I don't have it verbatim, but basically said, you're better off. The statistics aren't aren't with you. If you had a gun with you on that campus, um, it would have been worse. Uh, you, I don't know how you kept yourself collected. Your, well, it was to, amazing. I have to I have to correct you. It was actually Amanda Collins that she said the remarks oh, sorry, directly okay. to. Um, Amanda and I both testified on our separate sex assaults. Um, so you know, it's, you're both sitting there. Yes, together, that's yes. Right. so um, she said those words to Amanda and I felt them just as heavily because she's right. Amanda retorted perfectly that, you know, with all due respect, you weren't there. Well, talk to me just a little bit about if a gun was there, would it have been better? Could, was, was I hate to put it this way, was Evie Hudak possibly right? We can play the what if game as much as we want to. Um, what happened to me unfortunately happened, but I want to make sure that it doesn't happen to myself or my children again. And for me, that is going to be the best form of self-defense here. And were you a gun owner at the time? I wasn't. Um, I actually had probably an unhealthy fear of handguns just because I didn't grow up around them. Um, my parents and my family had shotguns and did a lot of hunting and stuff, but 
I, I had never owned my own firearm at that time, but that experience actually led me to do the proper amount of training and really um, immerse myself in what I feel is the best way to protect myself. Amanda Collins had a similar story, yes. but she was a gun owner, if I remember correctly, yes. but she could, not, she could not have her gun on campus. Where right. was that? Right, she went to, um, she, this was in Nevada, so it wasn't in Colorado, but it's, it, it's still um, a valid situation. Um, she went to school on a campus that was a gun-free zone, and so she left her firearm in her car. Um, while she was walking out to her car, in view of a call box, by the way, when she was walking out to her car, she was sexually assaulted, um, couldn't get to her car, couldn't get to her firearm. And um, the, the, her point to Senator Hudak, when Senator Hudak said, by the way, she, Evie Hudak had her hand on her heart saying, you, you just don't know these statistics. It would have been worse for you. And Amanda said, with respect, Senator, you weren't there. If I had had my firearm, I would have found a time to use it. And I think the point is, regardless of whether there would have been the ability to use it or not, it is not Evie Hudak's job. It is not anybody else's job to determine for me, to determine for Kimberly how we defend ourselves. That's our decision to make for our for ourselves. Let's take a quick break, but uh, when we get back, I want to I want to ask you, moving forward now in 2016, what it is you'd like to see happen. Stay tuned. Do you know why on January 28th, more than 600 students will be dancing at the state capitol? Here we go. The last week of January is National School Choice Week. Across the nation, there will be more than 16,000 events celebrating all kinds of school choice, shining a bright light on educational options that serve children the best. Here in Colorado, we're having a rally at the state capitol on the West Steps, Thursday, January 28th at 1130. Parents, teachers, students, policymakers will be all joining together to listen to speakers, break into the school choice dance, and just have a great time in celebration. Please join us and we'll be sure that you receive your own National School Choice Week scarf. So here we are, 2016. We now have these gun control measures that Evie Hudak and others wanted in place. There's a limit now of 15 rounds, and there are several guns which cannot take 15 rounds, and therefore those guns cannot be sold here. If you own one of those guns, you can't sell it, or at least you can't sell it with a magazine, so it's now useless. I don't know how that's not a takings issue uh, legally. And it's worth noting, thanks to Dave Kopel and what happened at the Independence Institute and the lawsuit that was put forward, the Attorney General changed the technical reading. Uh, as, as written, this would outlaw almost every magazine that had a removable base plate. So here we are. What is it you want? What do you think is going to happen this year? What would you like to see legislatively? So against the backdrop of where we are politically, so we have a, a Senate chamber that has a pro-gun majority, and the House chamber has an anti-gun majority. And I'm purposely not saying Republican and Democrat, because we actually do have some pro-gun Democrats in Colorado. It doesn't happen in every state, but we have that here. So, uh, and then obviously a Democrat governor. Late last year, there was some indication that the Democrats might be willing to go from f 15 rounds to 30 rounds. Is that what we want forever? No, we want all of the restrictions taken off. But if we can go in the right direction from 15 to 30, that's a win. Now we have, uh, there is a bill right now for a full repeal. If that passes, great, then we're done um, with that part of it. Um, I, I hate to break your heart. Sure. There's no chance of that right. happening. <laughs> right, not gonna not happen. Not now, not this session. Not gonna happen because there's not pro-gun majorities in, in both chambers and we have a Democrat governor who wouldn't sign that. Um, if slash when that doesn't pass, and we still show up, we still testify because those are our rights and we, we deserve not to have limitations. But if we can go from 15 to 30, 
from 15 to 29, from 15 to 28, that's a win. That goes in the right direction. And it's very similar to what they've done in um, Kansas, what they've done in Ohio. And that's a direction we should be going. So that's what I'll be looking for this year. So in other words, we lose our gun rights incrementally. You want to win them back incrementally. Right. And if that's what it takes. If that's what it takes. And um, I, I like to say, it's, uh, along with some other friends of ours, I'll take my rights back one round at a time if I have to. I, I saw an interesting exchange on, on Twitter where one of, one of the ankle biters said, <laughs> um, it's laughable, it's laughable that you need um, you know, more than 15 rounds to defend yourself. Uh, both of you weighed in and, and ended that argument pretty quickly. Why isn't it laughable? I, mean, I can't imagine looking into your eyes and saying, you know what, I, I need to be able to decide how you should defend yourself as a rape survivor. Sorry, I'm, I'm not laughing, actually. Um, but I've always lived by, well, it's gonna take as many rounds as it's gonna take. You can't predict when these are gonna happen and you can't predict how many rounds I'm gonna need. So the fact that you can hide behind your Twitter account and tell me otherwise, that's laughable. It's more than laughable, it's, it's sick. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's hurtful, I don't know how, how, how you put forward. Well, I mean, let's, let's take a look at that. Why would you need more than 15 rounds? Somebody's out there watching going, what, are you going to shoot 15 people? What, sure. what, you know, what, <laughs> why would you need that? I mean, therefore, it's okay. The collective has spoken. A male-dominated legislative body has said 15 is enough. Sure, so let's set aside the fact that it's none of their business. Let's just set that <laughs> fact aside. There are stories in the, in the news that are very easy to find where police officers who train, who are among the best trained gun owners uh, in the country, carry uh, what could be called high capacity, they're really standard capacity magazines in their Glock or Smith & Wesson, um, 17 round mags, 18 round mags, whatever. They carry extra, they carry a couple extra on their belt. Some that I know also carry even more in their car that can't fit on their belt. There are stories about putting 15 rounds into one guy who is still coming at you. Not shooting 15 rounds, putting 15 rounds into one guy. Um, if you have multiple assailants, what are you gonna do? Is every single round going to land on one of the four people attacking you? So there, number one, there are scenarios that, that require that. Number two, none of their business. Um, which firearm I choose. So, you know, we've talked about firearms that only come in 16 rounds. And I like to think of the woman who today got the, the restraining order against a violent ex who feels comfortable with that firearm that only comes in 16 rounds. Now she's got to go figure out, okay, well, what other gun do I feel comfortable with that's less than, that's 15 rounds or less? That's not okay. It's our job as individuals, women or men, as individuals to decide how we're going to protect ourselves and our families, not the government. This, this, this argument sparks a whole different level of discussion, and it has to do with ideological purity that, um, you know, it's one thing to vote for a full repeal of these bad laws because they're bad laws. People think that they're unconstitutional laws. I believe uh, it's an unconstitutional law. And that's why we're suing and hopefully going all the way to the United States Supreme Court. But then somebody takes your point of view and says, well, let's, let's see if we can move from a limit of 15 rounds to 30. Hell, from 15 to 20 so that women can buy the, the magazine and the gun that they feel most comfortable with. And there are people who are hardcore gun enthusiasts, Second Amendment enthusiasts, who say, you can't do that. That is a terrible thing to do because what you're doing is you're accepting that the government has the ability to limit. And it's all or nothing, otherwise you're selling out the Constitution. I think some anti-abortionists use the same uh, technique, which is, no, I don't want a waiting period on an abortion because then you're still saying you're legalizing it, you're giving it uh, permission. So. I want to ask you particularly, when you hear that argument that we can't do this because we're infringing upon the Constitution and anything less than a full repeal is saying that gun control is okay. We got to the spot that we are at because of measures like that. It, they are taking away one round at a time. We need to get it back one round at a time. It's not a matter of whether we're going against the Constitution or we're not. I'm a self-defense advocate. I want the ability to defend myself as best possible, and I also want to abide by the law. 
So to convince others that you know this is this is what's best in the short term, it may be an uphill battle, but at the same time, it's just as vitally important as that full repeal. I want to talk to you as a rape survivor, looking at a legislature that's almost that's dominated by men and a governor who's a man who voted this in, saying no, you can't have one more round in your gun, that you can't buy that Springfield XD because it comes only in a 16 round magazine. What, what do you want to tell them? Do you want to know what I want for mm -hmm. 2016 in a presidential election year? I want to stop being pandered to because I'm a woman, because I'm a victim, because I am a rape survivor. Stop pandering to me. There are more than 50% that make up our population voting public that are female. There are also one in four women statistically speaking, across the U.S. that are going to be a victim of sex assault at some point in their lives. We're not a, minor a minority. We are a huge part of this voting public. And for a side that constantly panders and says we are pro-victim, we're going to do all these things for victims' rights, when I go against that and I'm not going to sit there and fit into their perfect victim box with a bow on my head and speak out for my right to choice, which is self-defense in this case, I don't want to be pandered to. I don't want to be cast aside just because it's not the narrative that they like. I want them to understand that victims should have a voice too, even if it's not what's popular at the moment. But you're not doing the constitutionally pure thing. It has to be all or nothing, Laura. If you're not, what you're saying is they, the government, they, the people who put this in, they have the authority to, to limit your, your constitutional rights, and you're just squabbling about a number. We already lost our constitutional rights in 2013. I mean, we're, we have a limitation of 15 rounds right now. Uh, taking no step, and, and given our, our divided legislature, um, you, know, you, you laughed and said, sorry to break it to you, it's not going to pass. We all know that. Even the people that are saying that it's a violation of the Constitution to go to 16, 17, 30, whatever, um, we all know that we're not going to get anything. Um, one step is better than no steps, and we have to start going in that direction. I'm having a hard time imagining that the, the committee that hears this this bill, if somebody picks it up, and I don't know if anybody's going to pick it up, instead of just looking at a bunch of angry, white, bill-capped, camouflage-wearing gunnies out there saying, you know, the Constitution is my, you know, is, is my protector, you're going to do that, instead has to look at you women, who I think are a lot more intimidating than those gun owners. I don't know how they're going to handle it. We saw how Evie Hudak handled it. I'm not too sure how the rest are going to handle it. Right, and um, the the baseball cap camouflage wearing suspender guy, which kind of describes my dad. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I love that kind of gun guy. Um, gun owners look like everybody. They look like a cross section of America. But there, there's a stereotype that anti-gunners sure. love to use. And sometimes, all too often, I think a lot of us gunnies fall into that category too, only giving them more ammunition, pardon the, pardon the pun, sure. that, see, these are the people who, who want more, more rounds in, an, uh, in a gun, not people like you. Sure, and I think that's why some of the, as you call them, ankle biters on <laughs> Twitter attack people like Kimberly and like me, um, because we're, we're kind of hard for them to, to speak out against, to, to say to a rape survivor, you shouldn't be able to defend yourself in the way that you choose, um, to say to a woman, um, not a rape survivor, that some guy gets to decide how you defend yourself. That's very difficult for the other side to say. Or if we say, yes, I'm pro-choice on self-defense. If guns aren't for you, don't own one, but don't you dare tell me how to defend myself. They flap their arms a little bit. They don't. They really don't quite know what to do with us. Well, and I think that it just shows that the rhetoric that they've been you know, cramming down our throats forever, is, is, it doesn't work. But the more people like us that speak up and say, you know, I'm, I may catch some flack and some backlash here, but this is, this is where I'm at in life and this is what needs to happen. The more of us that come forward and start actually taking the chair in front of your Senate committees and speaking out against this because these are all of our rights, I think it's gonna be harder for them to keep pressing the same tactics that they have for so long. Let me draw a ridiculous an analogy. 
I remember when there were enough votes on the House floor to pass a civil unions bill, but a Republican um, uh, Speaker of the House did some procedural things to make sure it didn't get there. And of course, what happened next year is it passed, um, and I think a very different version. I feel like there's something similar going on here. Now, we, we understand that there's a pro-gun majority in the Senate, and it depends on whether or not they're going to choose to defend gun owners like you, or to choose to defend, you know, who beat their chest over who's more pure to the Constitution, but they want these, these things changed. I think the same thing is true in the House that there are enough Democratic votes to pass this, as there were enough Republican votes to pass the civil unions, but leadership is not going to let this go to the floor, would be my fear. Right, and we've we've seen in uh, the, the first bill that was offered, the first gun bill that was offered of constitutional carry, um, uh, no, the mag ban repeal, sorry, in the House. The Speaker of the House sent that to the Kill Committee and not the Judiciary Committee, so the State Veterans and Military Affairs Committee. Only got about a half a minute left. Let me, let me ask you, bring it to where we started. You looked at the President, he gave you that answer, the Evie Hudak answer, which was statistics aren't with you, which by the way I don't think is, is correct. Mm -hmm. I know you only had a limited time. After that, how do you feel? After the exchange, what do you think about the President and his position? I honestly feel like he's just another American citizen that should have the exact same voting power as I should, and to go against that and make himself out to be a king or a dictator would be riling up a lot of people just like me. Passing gun control laws without a vote through Congress. Being one of them. Would be one of them. Kimberly, thank you, and I think you're heroic for being able to speak out this way. Laura, always good to have you Absolutely. here. Check me out on KHOW Radio. Tell a friend about Independence Institute, and we'll see you next week.